Hello everyone, my name is Hao Su. I am a professor from UC San Diego. Today, I'm very happy to give a short lecture on a popular problem, deep learning on point clouds. We will discuss some representative algorithms of the field. Due to the prosperity of the field, there are many concurrent works. I will just pick the ones that are pioneering or the most familiar to me. Pardon me if I'm not able to cover your work or your favorite work. So here is the agenda for today's short course. Now first I'm going to introduce why we are interested in point cloud. And then I'm going to introduce some of the representative algorithms. We will start to introduce the backbone network architecture design for point cloud analysis. And then we will show a few applications with some featured interesting perspectives. So why we are interested in point cloud? So we are interested in the geometry of objects. And point cloud is perhaps the simplest representation of 3D. Usually it's made of points sampled from surfaces without connectivity information. For some of the applications like physical simulation, the points could also be from the interior of the object. And mathematically, a point cloud is a collection of XYZ coordinates or a set of coordinates. And for each of the coordinates, sometimes it comes with the normal information. The simplicity of point cloud makes it easy to be captured. And a lot of times that's the only thing available. For example, in autonomous driving scenario, if there's a LiDAR scanner installed, then it's able to capture the point clouds when a car drives. And then in indoor environments, Kinect is able to capture the depth maps and fuse into a point cloud. And for the stereo technique that could be used indoor or outdoor, they also give us point cloud. Well, it's worth noting that for the point clouds we obtain, they usually have face a lot of challenges, like the resolution might be limited or might be different given different types of sensors. And there might be the occlusion caused by other objects or there are self-occlusions. And there could be noise due to the sensor sensitivity and there would be registration issue that happens as fusing the point clouds along the temporal frames. And the simplicity of point cloud also brings in a second advantage. There's no connected information and therefore it's often easier to handle. For example, point cloud is sometimes viewed as a canonical representation of the surface. And if you add connectivity, there might be many different ways to add connectivity, but actually corresponds to the same underlying surface. And you will see this point when you see those follow-up algorithms. Next, let me introduce the backbone networks for point cloud analysis. Well, the fundamental challenge of applying deep learning on point cloud data comes from the irregularity of 3D data. Now, most of the successful deep learning algorithms assume regular data as input or output, such as images. Now, images are 2D matrices of intensities and colors, and this allows the convolution operation, a most basic building block for convolutional neural network. In contrast, point cloud is, well, a unordered set of point coordinates, and the convolution cannot be applied. So for the next, we're going to introduce point net, which is a kind of deep neural network architecture specifically designed to process the unordered point sets. It achieves end-to-end -end learning for unstructured and ordered point cloud data. If we think a bit more, then we should realize that for a neural network to process the point cloud, it has to satisfy two properties the permutation invariance and the transformation equivariance. For now, 
Let us assume that a point cloud is stored in the memory as a 2D array. It has n rows, and each row corresponds to a point. And d columns, each column corresponds to a dimension. For example, the x and y coordinate or their normal information. Assuming this 2D memory layout, let us introduce the permutation invariance first. Now by permutation invariance, we mean that if we change the order of the points stored in the memory, like you permute the rows of this 2D matrix, then for the function or the neural network to process this 2D array, the output value should not change. Mathematically, a neural network is just a function, and then in a functional view, a permutation invariant network just corresponds to a symmetric function. Recall the definition of the symmetric function. For any ordering of the argument, the function value is always the same. And many functions are symmetric. For example, the max function is symmetric as it is order invariant. The summation function is also symmetric. So guided by this observation, we can construct a symmetric function on 3D points in this way. First, we transform each point independently and identically by a small network. Then, we aggregate the point transformations by a simple symmetric function. Lastly, we post-transform the aggregated information by the small network. And this network always corresponds to a symmetric function. But one question still remains. Can any symmetric function be approximated by this simple network? Well, interestingly, we can show that any symmetric function that is continuous can be arbitrarily approximated by point net. Of course, if you want higher accuracy, you will need more internal neurons, which corresponds to, for each point, the output dimension by the H network should be higher. This is really great news. Now let's take a look at a neural network that's used in practice based upon the point net architecture. So the input is the n by 3 matrix 2D array that corresponds to a point cloud of n points, and each point is just x by z. So for each of a point, it will be transformed by several MLPs. And in the end, for each point, it becomes a high dimensional vector, 1024 dimensions. And there are n points, and therefore, the intermediate representation is the n by 1024 matrix. And then we will do a max of pooling. Note that this pooling is done for each of the column. And therefore, in the end, the entire shape is, shape is represented by a 1024 global feature. And then we will have a post-processing MLP that will predict the semantic category of the shape. And therefore, in the end, we get, get k output scores. This network can also be extended to do shape segmentation. Here, for each of a point, there is a local embedding that's 64 dimensions. Then recall that we have the shape level feature that's 1024 dimensions. So we just replicate the global feature and concatenate with each of the local embedding of the points. And that gives us each point as, an, as, as a 1088 dimensional vectors. So we can run a few MLP layers to predict a per point semantic label. Now here is the characteristic a property of point net, which is that it's pretty robust to data corruption. We use the 40 cloud shape classification as example. The x-axis is the ratio for the missing data, and the y-axis is the accuracy. Now we can see that as we are missing a lot of the data, the point net performance is quite stable. Whereas the baseline approach, which is to do the 3D convolution on the volumetric representation, the performance drops fast. 
So why is PointNet so robust to data corruption? Let's try to understand the point by some visualizations. The visualization tries to answer the question. Recall that our global feature vector is a 1024 dimension. Now I'm asking, if I'm dropping one of the n input points, will this global feature change? In other words, we want to test which input points are contributing to the global feature. Now here is the set of results. The first row is the, are the point clouds of the original shapes. Now if we want to drop some of the points, the feature will not change. In fact, for those points, if we drop them, the feature that will change will be called the critical point set. Let me visualize the critical point set. And you can see that it's a very sparse subset of the original set. And in fact, for this critical point set, the number of points will not exceed the dimension before you do the max pooling for the point features. Like for example, in an experiment of 1024 dimensions, at the most 1024 points belongs to the critical point set. And for this point, you can actually prove mathematically. Now we can also ask a opposite question. Now if we try to add some points, will it affect the point cloud feature? So let's check for adding what points will we not affect the global feature. So here are the results. And you can see that for the upper bound set, it will give the same global feature as the original shape. In fact, for any point set, that's including the critical point set and included by the upper bounded set, it will be the same global feature. So we can even conduct a further analysis on the features in the first layer. Recall that for each of the point X, Y, Z, it is transformed by an MLP, which we call it the H network, and assume that the last layer of this MLP is a ReLU. So we can check the output after the ReLU operation. Suppose that there are 1024 dimensions of this layer after the ReLU, and we check the dimensions one by one. So for each of the dimension, let's check what points will excite it. Practically, we will change the location of the x, y, z point and check for a point at different locations whether the certain dimension will be excited or not. And then we'll be able to get the visualization as here. For example, here is one of the dimensions. And you can see that if the x, y, z input point is within this gray region, then the dimension is excited. On the other hand, if it's the empty space, then this dimension is zero. And therefore, you can see that for each dimension as the output of H, it's actually learning an indicator of whether a certain region in the space there is the point or not. So you can think that the first layer of point net learns to partition the space in an adaptive manner and just to test whether there's a point in it. PointNet is a basic building block for a lot of neural networks processing point clouds. The very simple design of a PointNet gives the advantage in interpretability and some good robustness properties. However, there are also certain limitations of the PointNet architecture. And we can see the point by making a comparison with the classical convolutional neural networks. We see that in PointNet, every point is transformed to become a high dimensional vector. And then the information on the entire shape is pulled altogether. And therefore, there lacks the local context for each point. And that limits the ability to capture repetitive patterns. And the second limitation is that the global feature depends on absolute coordinate and that will affect its generalizability to the unseen scene configurations. So for the next, 
I'm going to introduce some follow-up work to address the limitations. So next, let me introduce a few works to try to address the local context problem and the translation invariance problem. So point net plus plus or point net v2 address the problem by a, a designing a multi-scale point net architecture. It starts from endpoints. Here the example is assuming that the points are on the 2D plane, but it works similarly in a 3D space. So it will sample a subset of points as the anchor points. We could consider using farthest point sampling to get the anchor points. And then for each of the anchor points, we will find its local neighborhood. So the local neighborhood forms a small set of points. And then we will subtract the coordinate for each of the point in the local neighborhood by the position of the anchor point. And this gives us a normalized local set. So we could apply point net in this normalized local sets and get a high dimensional feature of the group. So that finishes one layer of applying point net locally. And then we have a smaller set of points, but each point has not only the x, y coordinates, which are the anchor points, coordinates, and also the features of the group. So we could use x, y coordinates to group the points, and each point now is the height of the point, but we can still apply a point net to aggregate information. So we can repeat this process by sampling anchor points and find local neighborhoods and use a point net to abstract the local neighborhood until we have a global feature. This is called the set abstraction operation. Another idea to address the local context problem and the translation invariance problem is to view the point cloud processing problem as a graph processing problem. For example, you could consider to build the k nearest, nearest neighbor graph and then treat all the nodes as the points and um, for every neighboring points you add an edge. So you could use graph convolutional neural network to process the points. A representative works include um, like DGCNN and the relationship convolutional neural network. Now a third idea considers to build local neighborhood in a way that is um, volumetric. So it will try to build a coarse volumetric form of the input. So for each of the cell, it includes a number of points. And locally, you could use point net extract to extract a local feature. So then for the 3D volume, for each cell, there is a feature vector. And you can just treat it as a 3D volume in each cell with a fourth dimension as the channels of features. And then you conduct 3D convolution. This becomes um, popular in some applications that require extremely fast computation. Because here, the neighborhood relationship is by the regular grids, which can be computed very fast by hashing. Another fundamental challenge that people often talk uh, for point cloud learning is the rotation equivariance problem. So why we are interested in rotation equivariance? Well, this is because for the deep neural networks that we have trained, they are just fitting the input patterns. And in a lot of data sets, 3D data sets like ShapeNet, the shapes in it are aligned by orientation. And therefore, if you are doing shape classification or recognition in the wild, the shape is not the same oriented as the shapes in ShapeNet, it will fail. It is just an example. And one way to address the problem was to use data augmentation. But data augmentation is very uh, costly and also it will reduce the effectiveness of the network by taking a lot of uh, its capacities. So how can we address the rotation equivariance problem? 
without doing data augmentation. There are many good works of this line, and here I'm just going to pick one of the representative works to introduce, which is called the Vector Neurons, or VN. This is a general framework that is simple but quite versatile, improving the ability of many existing point cloud networks. It works by introducing a number of building blocks for building equivariant networks, like linear layer, the nonlinear layers, the pooling layer, the normalization layer, and also the invariant layer. And therefore, for your existing point cloud that is not point cloud network is not equivalent, you can replace your layers by those newly proposed ones, and then immediately you get a equivalent network for free. So what is the key innovation of vector neurons? Is in representing the neurons. In deep learning, we are very used to have each neuron as a scalar, and therefore the feature vector of a shape is a 1D array. Uh, for a layer, for example, the fully connected layer, it becomes that we try to connect neurons that are the dimensions of the vectors. And vector neurons extend the concept of a neuron as a scalar to a neuron as a 3D vector. This is a bit like complex numbers, but complex numbers are like 2D vectors, but here the vector neuron is using a 3D vector for each of the neuron. Therefore, in the classical neural networks, the feature vector is the 1D array, but for the vector neurons, the feature vector is a feature vector list, as in the paper, and which is a 2D array. And we, we are building the fully connected layers between two vector neuron layers, we are adding connections to link the different 3D vectors in the layers. In vector neurons, to achieve the equivalence of the nonlinearity, that's a bit tricky. Now let's see how we could transform the classical ReLU to become the ReLU nonlinearity with the equivalence. Assume that we have a point cloud and there are endpoints. For each of the point, it's represented by C neurons, and note that each of the neuron is a three-dimensional vector. And therefore, for the vector list representation of the point, it's a matrix V that's 2D. Each row corresponds to a neuron, and each column corresponds to one of the three dimensions. We assume that this V is C by 3. Let's describe how we achieve the value down linearity for such a vectorized neuron representation. So for the vector neurons, each vector plays as a complex number, although not exactly a complex number. So when we do the value operation, there is a idea that it will try to truncate the value along certain orientation, but not along every orientation. And therefore, for here, we will learn the direction that the nonlinear transformation will take effect. We introduce two matrices, W and U, each of which is 1 by C. Recall that C is the number of the vector neurons. So Q, sorry, W and U will transform the vector neurons for a point to become two three-dimensional vectors. Then, if the Q and K has the angles less than 90 degrees, we will just keep the learned feature Q. Otherwise, we will find the projection of Q onto the k direction and then remove the component. Here, the operation to remove the component projecting to the direction is the same as how we did for ReLU, that we truncate the value below zero. For other layers of 
a conventional neural network, the vector neurons paper gave the surgery to make them equivalent. The vector neurons paper shows how to um, translate the original point net to a equivalent version of the point net by replacing the original MLP layers H by the equivalent MLP layers F and the original pooling operation by the equivalent pooling operation. The paper also showed how to transform another graph neural network like point cloud learning framework, which is the DGCNN, to become the equivalent version. It just uses the proposed new edge convolution, which is edge, um, edge, uh, equivalent, and the pooling operation is equivalent to replace the original layers. The paper of vector neurons also showed some very nice results on shape classification and other interest applications like uh, surface reconstruction. Let me just show you some results on the classification. On the uh, benchmark model net 40 for shape classification, the vector neurons networks uh, shows very good robustness to the unseen rotations. If you are interested in more results, especially the implicit function prediction, you can refer to the original paper. Um, next, I'd like to discuss a bit of some related uh, architecture design tricks. Because transformer is so popular, there are also approaches to consider introducing transformers to increase the attention ability in point cloud um, analysis. In fact, you should not be surprised by seeing those um, transformer style works to model point clouds because point cloud itself is just a set, right? So each point can be thought as a token. So in a community of uh, uh, sequence modeling, there are different ways to consider the connectivities between or among the tokens. Like the convolution gives a very local receptive field and recurrence gives a, a gradually um, uh, increased connectivity and self-attention builds a fully connected um, connectivity among the tokens and then causal attention considers some uh, like a, well, uh, uh, temporal considers the arrow of the time. Okay, so in order to achieve self-attention a very powerful tool is the transformer. There are many works um, in the past few years that tries to add transformers to like point cloud learning. And I just listed some. I'm sorry that I'm not able to enumerate them all. Okay. So um, here I'm going to illustrate the idea using a work that's called the PCT, the point cloud transformer published on CBM. Um, I choose it because um, the paper is pretty comprehensive in illustrating the possible ways to add transformers, transformers to point cloud analysis. So here, I will pick two ways to model the attention between the points. The first is the sentence model style. Well, in the paper PCT, point cloud transformer, it says that this is a naive way of modeling. So um, so we have a point cloud, right? Assume that there are n points, and using the MLP as, in, as, as we did in point net, we we'll lift the point to become a DE dimensional point embedding. And then we could actually um, introduce three matrices, the WQ, WK, and WV. And the three matrices are linear transformations to compute the query, the key, and the value for each of the point. And then you could just do as what you did for image analysis um, to achieve the self-attention using the query, the key, and the values. Note that here the key advantage is that you're able to attend to very remote points in space. And then one of the issues is that 
Now, if your point count is a lot of points, then this means it's huge computational complexity. Then the paper also introduced an idea to progressively uh, achieve self-attention among the points. So uh, just to re read what the paper says. It says, to draw upon the ideas of point plus plus and DGCN, design a local neighbor aggregation strategy, the neighbor embedding, to optimize the point embedding to augment the PCT's ability of local feature extraction. So there it introduces the hierarchy and the local context. Okay, we just introduced some backbone pointing cloud networks. And in fact, there are some issues like the challenges brought by the non-uniformity non well, of the subject sampling. Um, but for the sake of time, we don't have time to discuss it in depth. And next, let me show some of the applications of the backbone point cloud networks. They are the 3D detection and the 3D generative model. So what is 3D object detection? When you now are set up, um, the input is usually the sensor data of a 3D scene, like the RGB images, like the depth maps, like the uh, range map from the, the radar. And then we want to localize the object net and identify the semantic classes for each of the objects we're interested in, and then even estimate the pulse of the objects, for example, by orientation and location. And a lot of times, um, we might want to complete the bounding box of object for the part of an object that are even invisible. So let's be concrete. And it's very suitable to use point clouds to represent the input of the 3D scene. For example, there are n points in the point cloud, and therefore for each point is a 3 plus c uh, vector that the dimensions represent x, y, z, or features like the color from the RGB camera, or like the intensity for the surface reflecting the radar waves. Then for output, we prefer to use upright aligned 3D A model bounding boxes. Like if we predict the bounding boxes, there could be information about uh, where the object is, the size of the bounding box, and the orientation of the bounding box. And then for each of the bounding box, there could be the semantic class for the object in it, and then a score of the bounding box that represents the object in it. Now, in general, the solutions to the problem can be grouped into three families. The first family is image-driven, which leverages 2D object detectors on the input RGB images. And then the second family is called the dimension reduction, which mainly uses the burst eye view detectors, but are uh, 3D native. And then the third family leverages the sparsity in 3D. Let's explain them one by one. So let's start from the image-driven 3D object detection. Um, as we are capturing the point clouds, it's very often, like in autonomous driving setup, that we will have the registrations between the input fields and the point clouds. Like for the pixels, we know which point in the point cloud it corresponds to. And then it's possible for us to leverage the mature 2D object detectors to propose objects from the RGB images. Like we could have the input images and point clouds registered and then run some object to the object detector on the image. And that gives you a 2D bounding box. For the 2D bounding box, when it's lifted 3D, it corresponds to a view first time. The view first time will crop out a certain portion of the point clouds. We remove the points not belonging to the first time. So within the first time, there are the points that belong to the object of interest there are also points that belong to other categories. And particularly, I want to mention that for the 2D object detect step, not only we have the bounding box, but for every box, there is a there is information of the object category that the bounding box should cover. And therefore, within the first term, 
we try to segment the points that belongs to the object category of, of, of interest. So here we basically solve a binary uh, mask prediction problem. Like for every point we belong predict whether it belongs to the object interest or not. And that will allow us to remove points irrelevant to the object interest. And for the very next step, we will have fewer points and we will predict the A model bounding box. So what is A model bounding box? That means the bounding box cover the entire object, including the invisible part. So for the second step of instant segmentation, and the third step of um, A model bounding box prediction in the work of a frost and point nest, they're both done by the point net. And therefore, the idea is the points test for the data-driven of detection in the frost tunnels. The method is very effective in practice. Let's take a look at this uh, KT result for detecting vehicles and cyclists and, 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 and person. Okay, so we have the 2D bonding boxes, uh, then for each of the 2D bonding box, it corresponds to a 3D A model bonding box. We can see that the orientation of the objects are well predicted and a lot of times they are just a predict from just like a dozen of points. And besides, uh, it's very good at predicting or regressing the A model bounding box. Okay, so from the success of Frost and Point Nets, we learned two key lessons. The first lesson is representation matters. Um, to illustrate the point, we have a baseline result that's from the instant segmentation on the depth map. So given the depth map, we can actually use mass RCN to perform a perfect so, um, semantics or, or instant segmentation and pop it up in 3D. As we can see, it's actually very difficult to handle the boundary very well. Because for the points, although they are very distant in 3D, on 2D image space, they are very close. So it's difficult for CNN to handle it well. On the other hand, the point net uh, uh, solves the segmentation problem natively in 3D, and therefore it's able to get a much cleaner uh, segmentation result. And the second lesson we learned is that coordinate transformation really matters. Okay, so in this work, we actually introduced the four coordinate frames. The first, the camera coordinate frame, which is the frame for the LiDAR <coughs> to capture the point cloud. And then once we have the object located on a 2D image, we build a frost time, we actually could build a frost time orientation, uh, frost time coordinate by aligning one orientation or frame to be at the center of the frost time. Then for this approach, it addresses the translation environment for the object captured in image space. And then uh, when we have the we crop the points belonging to frost time, we can compute the center of the of points, which um, is likely to correspond to where the object locates. So we can translate the frost and coordinate so that its origin aligns with the um, center. So that allows us to address the alignment of objects better. And then point net has a transformer, spatial transformer architecture that further aligns the orientation of objects. So from the right table, we can see that by introducing those additional alignment uh, or transform, uh, you know, the connectalization by the corner transformations, we're able to boost the performance quite, by quite a large margin. So to summarize, um, we need to respect and exploit the 3D. Repetition matters because we use 3D repetition and 3D deep learning for the 3D problem. And um, canonicalization of input matters because it reduces the need for data augmentation and also helps to generalize to unseen scenarios. So to achieve this goal, we exploit the geometric transformation of the important clouds that are unique in a 3D space. And note that in a 2D space, we're not able to achieve the real 3D transformation. Um, but although well, although the, the first point nets is very powerful, there are certain limitations because it has hard dependence on the 2D detectors. And thus, it will miss objects due to strong occlusions in the 2D views or unfavorable limitation conditions that causes unclear RGB image or like uh, uh, some difficulty in detection in RGB image. And also note that although we have provided semantic category for each of the bounding box, um, in fact, when we build the frost, um, 
we're only locating a single object within the bounding box. Like if you have a few people walking together, then um, if your 2D bounding box is not so accurate, the, inside the first time the point net will have difficulty in associating the points and predict the segment, the instant segmentation. And therefore, we seek for solutions that is more 3D native, that we want to get object proposals from 3D uh, point clouds. So the second family approach addressed the problem by the dimension reduction. Okay. Uh, the basic idea is to consider the burst eye view 3D object vector. And in fact, those approaches will try to convert, still try to convert the 3D learning problem to a 2D learning problem. <coughs> but I'd like to emphasize that um, the key difference for like uh, here to convert the 3D problem to 2D problem than the previous approach is that uh, for the image driven approach, it leverages the perspective transformation to get a 2D image from the 3D. And then the perspective transformation will have distortion effects. Some distances will get longer or some are get shorter. Whereas for here, we want to respect the 3D more and use the way to convert 3D to 2D without the distortion. Like for an earlier work in 3DPR 2016 by uh, Chi et al., um, we proposed to use elongated kernel to convolve the 3D volumetric space um, this elongated kernel that is small in the width and height dimension but uh, thick in a depth dimension could gradually transform a 3D volume to become a 2D pseudo image. And then we can use your favorable 2D image detector or like a, a segmentation algorithm to get um, the object. <coughs> a more modern attempt is the point pillar work. So this is suitable for autonomous driving setup um, to consider their discrete view, right? And then I'll um, assume that the x of y, z is a coordinate of each point and z corresponds to elevation or height direction. So the method will discretize the x, y space to two degrees. <coughs> so for each two degrees, we will um, build a pillar that includes all the elevations. So the pillar will cover certain points inside it. So for the pillar, we will use a point net to process the points inside it and get a per pillar uh, feature. For example, you get a 64 dimensional feature. And then this input view from, top, from, from, the, from the bird eye view, is has, well, this, this, sorry, this uh, point cloud from the bird's eye view is converted to a pseudo image. Like here, um, for the pseudo image, you could use your, your favorable uh, object detector like the SSD 2D detector to predict the objects and predict orientation bounding boxes. So the significant advantage of the bird eye view approach is that it has good inference speed and also very simple to implement. Now take a look at the figures on the right. Um, they are the plot. The x-axis is the runtime, which is in terms of hertz, <coughs> and the y-axis is the performance. For each of the dots is a label that represents an approach. <coughs> the PP represents the point pillar approach. And we can see that point pillar is able to run at a good speed, but also with decent performance. There are also certain weaknesses of the approaches <coughs> that they usually assume a projection plane. And this prevents us to work well for uh, complex 3D scenes. For example, in 3D uh, street view, usually within an X, Y grid, the elevation, the points concentrates around a certain elevation. Whereas <coughs> in indoor scene, the points could be very much um, evenly distributed at different elevations and therefore the aggressive uh, compression of the dimension is not such a good idea. Okay. So for complex indoor environments, it's probably more suitable to com consider leveraging the sparsity in the 3D space. Well, although objects is, um, lies in the 3D space, a surface is actually just a 2D manifold. And from perspective of the 3D, it actually just occupies very limited volume. And therefore, 
we call it as a sparsity, and it could use the sparsity aware backbone architectures to design good architect, uh, networks. And this is more suitable for like the complex indoor environments. Now let's use some uh, <coughs> examples to illustrate the sparsity. So left is the image, which is a dense 2D piece array, and the right is the visualization of the points. And you can see that they are only on the surface. So that only occupies a very limited space in a 3D. Now representing the work to, of this family is the PBN 3D work. It assumes a pair of input, the RGB and the depth map, which are registered with each other. And then it will use a convolutional neural network to process the image input and get a per pixel feature. It will also use the point net to process the point cloud to get a per point feature. Now because they have pixel and the point registrations, we're able to um, augment the point features by the pixel features. So for each of the point, there will be the feature to describe local geometry and also the appearance. And then for the approach, it uses a MLP to predict a per point semantic label, like the semantic category the point belongs to. The method for each point also predicts um, an offset that is from the point to the center of the object it belongs to. So then for each of the point, it has a prediction of the object center and the semantic label. And we could vote and cluster and then got instant segmentation of the objects in the scene. The pipeline not only gets the instant segmentation, but also wants to predict the orientation of the object. To achieve this goal, it uses the 3D key point detection approach. The method assumes knowing the key points of each of the object in some canonical space. And for each of the objects in the scene, it will also predict the location of the key points. The prediction of the key points um, <coughs> are again using the offset prediction approach. And then also by voting. So with the predicted key points for the object in the scene and the known key point locations in the canonical space, it's actually able to vote on a cluster and solve um, the relative transformation R and T from the canonical space to the camera frame using Umiyama's algorithm. And therefore, it's able to predict the six degree freedom uh, post of each object. Another example is a more recent work called CAPTCHA. CAPTCHA tries to achieve the part level object post tracking for rigid or articulated objects. For more of the details, you can refer to the original paper. Okay, next, um, I'm going to talk about another family of problems that are generating point clouds or the point cloud generating model. So there are a few ways to achieve, to build generative models. Um, and then for each of the approach, there are certain works for point cloud understanding as well. Now, the first uh, um, family of approaches um, use the variational autoencoder style methods to generate points. As we know, for VAEs, right, they will use um, the data itself as the supervision. This is like predicting the self. Like for image reconstruction, it, sorry, for image generative models, it will try to reconstruct images. And then for here, we will try to reconstruct the point cloud. Now, compared with the image setup, the key challenge is how do we build a loss to compare two point clouds? So we need some kind of point set distance. Now in this early work to describe a point set generation network, um, <coughs> it proposes to use the chamfer distance and earth movers distance as the loss function. The key idea is to solve the point correspondence problem between the ground truth point cloud and the predicted point cloud. And note that 
uh, for this process is part of network, but is justified to be differentiable. And therefore, we can build a variational autoencoder style generative model for point clouds. And it's also possible to use generative adversarial network style um, uh, architecture to build a generative model for the point cloud. So in the early work, um, <clears throat> learning representations and generative models for 3D point clouds, the authors used the fully connected layers as the generator, and then used the point net as the discriminator. Um, on the right side, you can see some of the representative generated results. As we can see, the general shapes looks reasonable, but the details are a bit um, not as not ideal. It has been a big challenge to consider improving the local details of the results for a GAN style um, generative model of point clouds. But there are some difficulties. Okay, for basically for almost every point cloud GAN in field, they use the point net as this discriminator, not even point net plus plus. But we do know that the point net um, focused on the general shape, but not the details. As we mentioned when we introduced the point net in a previous section, uh, point net <coughs> has the critical set and the upper bound set. And then between the two sets, they just this are the same for the point net. And therefore, it's really important to use you know, a discriminator that would give better supervision to the generator. However, we find that in practice, it's pretty tricky. Um, so because for the discriminators stronger than point net, like point net plus plus, they are usually very sensitive to the differences in point cloud density than the, than the shape. What I mean is that, um, like for this generative adversarial network, the discriminator is responsible for telling the difference between the fake data generated by the network and the real data. But for point net plus plus or DGCN and the stronger networks, they tend to attend to like the density patterns rather than the shape of the points. Okay. And usually they are just too powerful for the generator to improve the shape. Like um, in the paper <coughs> um, that was by Wang et al they show some of the visualization for using different variations of point net and the point net plus plus and DGCNN for the discriminator. As we can see that, um, it seems like only variants of the point net could, uh, could work. Okay. Uh, through the experiments of my own group, we have one conclusion that we should try to avoid using batch normalization because for the input of the, of the point cloud of the point net, they are the coordinates, and the batch normalization will ca cause some uh, very tricky scaling issues. Okay, so to summarize, it is an open problem to find point cloud discriminators better than the point net. And if you're interested in the problem, I encourage you to have a try. A third family of important, gener uh, important family of generative uh, models is the diffusion model. And diffusion model has also been applied to point cloud in recently, very recently. So in this work, it tries to use the denoising diffusion model to transform the Gaussian noise, the points, point clouds from the Gaussian noise to some meaningful objects. It basically applies point net repeatedly to move the points to the right position. And the paper also shows that it's possible to generate the point cloud by diffusion model conditioned on an incomplete point cloud. So it's able to do the point cloud completion. Uh, take a look at the following results for um, diffusion model based uh, point cloud com completion. The first column is the partial point cloud input, and then 
the follow up columns are the completed point, point cloud. You can see that the diffusion model works pretty well and it's close to the ground truth. So just now, we have introduced two major applications of point cloud for object detection and for building generative models. Next, I'm going to talk about a topic that is to connect point cloud to other type of 3D implementations, especially the surface. So here's the formulation of the problem. Assume that we have the point cloud as input. The point cloud could be the points with x, y, z coordinates, or could also have normal information. And we'll see that uh, for this application, normal is very important. And then what we want to get is a mesh. Okay, it's the mesh of the object surface. So basically, we would like to recover the uh, latent connectivity information between the points. In general, there are two families of algorithms to convert the point clouds to surfaces. We call one family of approaches as the explicit methods. So the idea is, given the points, try to connect the points to become edges and faces. And then there's a second family that is indirect. We call it imp in implicit methods. So from the point cloud we have, we try to predict an implicit function that corresponds to the surface of the object. We know that the implicit function is a function that uh, <coughs> the surface is the level set of it. Uh, well, in, in practice, it's very often to consider using the signed distance field or SDF as this implicit uh, field function. So given the implicit uh, surface function, we could actually extract the surface by, uh, well, the ISO surface by algorithms like Martian cube. And next, let me introduce them one by one. Well, the first family algorithm is the explicit methods. I think it's best to illustrate the general idea by an algorithm called ball pivoting. So here is a 2D example. And you can see that, um, well, you start from like a corner of the set of points, and then you have a ball of a certain radius. And then you try to uh, roll the ball. And while you're rolling the ball, it will hit the points, and then it will go around the surface object. And this will, in the end, give you a closed polygon. For the 3D surface reconstruction, it's similar. It's just like the ball will roll and then will give you the triangles. Now, it's obviously, uh, well, it's pretty obvious that um, uh, it's very tricky to set the radius of this ball, right? When it's too small, um, it's likely to create a lot of holes, but when it's too large, it's ignoring some structures at a small scales. Well, it's not even hard to decide the radius of the ball. Sometimes it's just impossible. Like take a look at this example. Um, we have these points. And in our mind, we tend to interpret as two um, circles, right? Or um, ellipses. But in fact, the gaps between the points for the same ellipses is larger than the distance between the two ellipses. And therefore, if you run the ball pivoting, it's very likely to co connect the two spheres, uh, two ellipses or, uh, or circles together. <coughs> and there's just no row value available allows us to separate them. So why do we humans are able to learn a separate, to, to, to see the separation. Because in our mind, we have some geometry priors. Okay, this example motivates the need to consider a learning approach for the point cloud to surface uh, conversion problem.
Now, here are some real examples. Uh, we ha if we apply the ball pivoting algorithm, we will get the surface reconstruction from point cloud as the top row. Okay, so in fact, for this chair, we see that between the slates, there should be the <coughs> hollow space, right? But uh, for the reconstruction, we're not able to see them, although we actually see some small dents. Okay. And then another example is this uh, chair, right? This chair with the back. On the back, uh, between the slates, there should be this, the, the, the empty um, well, <coughs> space, whereas the algorithm is not able to reveal it. But we can use learning-based approach to address the issue with much better quality. Um, here's a result from by, by a paper that uses intrinsic-extrinsic ratio um, to reconstruct the surface from the point cloud. And you can see that um, we are able to separate the slates here, separate the bars at the back, right? And for the surfaces like the monitor on the screen, there are uh, much fewer uh, small dents. So how did it do? It actually uses a, a 3D geometry concept that is the intrinsics or geodesics. So what is the geodesics? Now consider this surface, okay? And there are the surface of this chair. There are two points on the surface of the chair. Well, you could easily measure their Euclidean distance. See, you draw a line segment between the center of this five star and this uh, dot, right? And then the length is the Euclidean distance. But the Euclidean distance is not along the surface. Now, consider if you do have access of the connectivity information, the point cloud, then there will be the surface. And then on the surface, you can actually try to find the shortest path from the center star to the center of the ball. Right? And the length of this shortest path is called the geodesic distance between the surface points. So for our learning-based approach, at training time, we have the points sampled from the meshes, but also we have the ground truth mesh, assuming this is a, um, known to the algorithm. And then, in fact, we're able to predict the geodetic distance between points on the surface. Okay, so we have introduced the idea of the intrinsics or the geodetic distance. And then next, we're going to introduce an algorithm that leverages the intrinsic distance or the geodesic distance um, to like reconstruct the surface from point clouds well. Okay. So let's define a quantity which is called the intrinsics extrinsics ratio. Now given two vertices U and V on a surface, this ratio is defined as um, the geodesic distance between the two points and the Euclidean distance between the two points. If we define this quantity in this way, what shall we see? So here is a visualization of this ratio. Now, given this point cloud of the chair, then we will choose one point on the back, which is actually on the bar. And then we compute the, well, within this window, we compute the geodesic distance from this point to any other point. And this is the visualization. That's the geodesic distance from the point to any other point. Uh, well, blue means the distance is small, and uh, green, well, yellow means the distance is big. Okay, and you can also compute the intrinsic extrinsic ratio between this point and well, for 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 the well, pair of points of this one and any other point at the bank at the back. Okay, and we also use the color to visualize this ratio. We can see that uh, for this part the ratio is close to one. And for this part, the intrinsic access transit ratio is very big. So basically, if the ratio is close to one, you can say, uh, well, the two points are uh, 
well, on the same surface. Okay. Otherwise, it may not be, it may, may, may not, you know, uh, be able to be directly connected. Okay. And in fact, that was for a pair of points. For a triangle, you can also define the intrinsic extrinsic ratio. And the ratio is defined by, uh, well, the sum of the geodesic distance between the any pair of the three vertices uh, divided by the Euclidean distance between any pair of the, the sum of uh, the distance between any pair of points. Okay, so if the point UVW is close enough, um, we should also check its IER ratio. If this IER ratio is also very close to one, like within one plus epsilon, then it's likely that we should connect them together to form a triangle. Now, if this ratio is very big, even if they are close, you shouldn't connect them. Okay, so, well, I just mentioned that you can use a network to predict this DG, the geodetic distance, but what really matters is this ratio, right? And therefore, in practice, we learn a neural network to predict um, the ratio or predict whether the ratio is below the threshold. Okay. So this intrinsic extrinsic ratio for triangles allows us to connect the points to form the surfaces. Like here, we use a, um, a greedy algorithm to connect um, well, triples of points into surfaces uh, following the intrinsic extrinsic ratio, and we get this uh, this 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 desk with descent looking well. Although there are still some issues at the host, but then for the nearest neighbor that uh, we just connect nearby points to become triangles, that actually has much larger issues. Okay. So these are the um, explicit methods that would directly connect the points to become the surfaces. And next, let me introduce the implicit methods. And the first, convert the points, a uh, point cloud to a implicit field function. And then we extract the isosurface of the implicit uh, field function as the, um, as the surface. Okay, so what is an implicit field function? Okay, um, in fact, here is a sign one. And we assume that we have a watertight manifold of some object, okay, the surface. And then for the points inside the surface, okay, because the watertight, you can decide inside and, and, and outside. Now for the inside, we say, the function value is less than zero. And then for the outside points, the function value is greater than zero. And therefore, the zero level set or zero isosurface is the surface. Okay, so, um, well, you can see this rabbit. Uh, inside is blue, that means it's negative value. And outside is red, that means it's, um, it's like positive value. Okay, so it's very often that people try to put the sign, well, build the sign descent field as an implicit field function. Now here, it just means that for the magnitude of this function, either interior or exterior, we make it to be the distance to the surface. Okay. So having introduced the concept of implicit field function, we can introduce the skeleton of the implicit matching algorithm. There are two basic steps. The first step is to estimate an implicit field function from the data. Here the data is the point cloud. And then we extract the zero as a surface. Usually we need a normal information to build the watertight matches. This point is very different from the explicit methods that we don't really need the normal information. It's also worth noting that obtaining the consistent normal orientation is non-trivial. Okay, and in fact, there are special cases like the Mobius strip 
um, there just does not exist a consistent normal orientation. But here we're talking about the watertight meshes, like the for this family of approaches, um, well, there what theoretical there is the consistent normal orientation. But to achieve the consistency, it's actually quite a global property, and therefore just having well the normal estimation from fitting a plane locally um, will not guarantee the consistency. And in fact, there exists a um, learning-based approach to predict the normal um, so that they are consistent in orientation. But uh, for the sake of time, we don't discuss it. We just assume that if we have the information. Now, if we have the information, we can actually use a neural network to convert a point cloud with the normal information to become um, a proxim implicit field function. So typically, for the points, because they have normals, you can move the point along the normals or the opposite direction on the normals and then you will get um, some different points, right? Now these points, when they're along the normals, you give them the positive sign, and then when they're along the negative the normal direction, you give a value of the, well, negative sign, and you, you can just use the neural network to take the move the points as an input, which is x, y, z as the input, and then predict either the positive um, distance or the negative distance, depending on you, you move along the normal or not. If in this way, you'll be able to train a neural network. And in fact, it's the way that you'll learn neural network to overfit a single shape. Okay, so if you want to have a kind of like a, a implicit field function for a family of, for, for collecting the shapes, you can also consider to, to use uh, the code of the shape. And then you will fit the code of the shape and S, Y, Z together and use MLP to predict assign a distant field value. So after this step, assume that you basically have obtained a sign a distant function for the corresponding point cloud. For the next step, we need to extract a zero isosurface. How did we achieve this goal? So we will first decompose the space into volumes, and then at all the vertices, we will evaluate the sign a distant function so then you have a 3D volume. At the vertices, you have positive or negative values. And then you can run an algorithm that's called the marching cube to extract the surface. And note that if you want to get a high resolution surface, usually you need to make the uh, 3D volume quite dense. Okay, so these are the approach that assumes consistent normals are given. Now what if you don't have consistent normals? Um, it's not impossible to address the, set, the setup. There's a process sign uh, agnostic learning approach for getting the uh, assigned decent function. So the method is able to um, take a point cloud without normal information and obtain a unsigned decent function. And then it will be able to convert this unsigned using function to a signed one. And, usually, and, and then for this approach, you actually need to know just the one point, which is in the interior of the surface. So this single point in the interior helps you to identify the, 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 uh, the sign. Okay, so just now we introduced and algorithms to convert point clouds to surfaces, right? And next, we're going to introduce um, how point cloud could be used to achieve inverse graphics, or more um, explicitly, how to achieve radiance field estimation using point cloud. The original NERF model optimized the scene by taking hundreds of multi-view images. Along each camera ray, NERF samples hundreds of shading points, and even most of them are in empty regions. Now, during shading, NERF encodes the entire radiance field as MLPs, which take the shading location, the ray direction, um, and output RGB color and the volume density. Now, since NERF is unaware of scene geometry, 
um, its shading sampling is inefficient. And using a single network encoded as seen also makes it hard to scale and converge. Now, to address the issues, point nerve leverage multi-view reconstruction methods to quickly reconstruct a point cloud. Uh, then, it installs neural features on each point and obtain a neural point cloud. During rematching, point nerve skips all the empty regions and only computes shading near the geomet geometric prior. This efficient sampling strategy differentiates point nerve from previous NERF models. Once the array arrives the nearby regions of the geometric prior, point NERF queries k nearest neural points and uses the relative positions that the point features and the redirections and input to compute RGB color and volume density. So the efficient sampling strategy, the regions field localization, the flexibility of points um, help point, ner point NERF to achieve fast convergence, high rendering quality, flexibility for editing, and strong scalability for large scenes. So to get the shape prior from the 2D images input, a multi-view reconstruction network generates depth images and combines them to a point cloud. Well, the method can also use an existing point cloud. Then, another feature extraction network projects the image features onto the points and finally create a neural point cloud. So during optimization, uh, point nerf only samples the shading points near the shape prior. For example, uh, XA, XB, and XC. The K nearest neural points are queried. And the features are aggregated according to the relevant positions to the shading location and the scale value and point confidence. The MLPs use the aggregated features to generate a view dependent colors and the volume density. After aggregating the radiance along the ray, you can calculate the rendering loss between the generated and the ground truth color on the pixel. Okay. And then the gradients will optimize not only the MLPs, but also the point features. Now, since the radiance field is distributed as point features, a local representation without the limited resolution, point nerve can encode more fine grained details and high frequency information, and thus finally achieves better rendering quality than nerve, sparse voxel based nerve methods, and other point based rendering methods. Um, by leveraging the shape prior and image feature projection, point nerve also achieves a convergence speed, uh, which is 30 times faster than nerve. In the end, let me introduce um, some methods to connect point cloud learning and a language. So pre-trained vision language models cover a broad set of visual concepts and use natural language 
to refer to the learned visual concepts. For example, uh, CLIP includes a text encoder and an image encoder and is trained over, with over 400 million image text pairs using contrastive pre-training. So the pre-trained vision language models have already transferred to many 2D vision tasks like zero-shot image classification and text-guided image synthesis. Now, 3D deep learning suffers from severe data scarcity, especially labeled data. Can we leverage the rich knowledge and the visual concepts from the free trained vision long tree models? Now, the key is to build a bridge between the 3D data and the 2D images. For example, we can render or project the 3D data onto 2D images. And this could be achieved by renderer. Um, if you want to backpropagate information from the image space to the 3D space, you can also consider to use a differentiable renderer. And if you have the RGBD images, the, 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 well, it's even simpler because the 2D pixel is already naturally associated with the 3D point. So there is a recent work uh, that's called Point Clip, um, which understands the point clouds using the clip. Uh, the method is, is kind of straight, that it first project the 3D point clouds onto the 2D. And then, well, because 2D images are connected with the language by the clip, you are able to connect language with 3D. You could do zero-shot classification, like you could directly use the pre-trained visual language model to predict. Or you could do few-shot learning, that you could fine-tune the classification head with a few uh, 3D point cloud data with the labels. There are also works that tries to achieve a text-driven shape generation. So given a sentence or some test description about what you want to generate for the 3D shape, um, you try to generate a shape, and then you could use the clip feature as a discriminator and check like whether the the, the embedding of the shape that you generate will match the image embedding for the reference that you provide. So this similarity score could be used to supervise the optimization of the shape. Okay, uh, so today we have introduced many point cloud learning algorithms, including the backbone point cloud networks, like how to use point cloud to achieve 3D object detection or part segmentation and the 3D generative models and how do we use learning to convert a point cloud to surface with the basic geometry priors and how we could use point cloud to achieve inverse graphics like the NERF and even how can we connect point cloud to other data modalities like language. But I really want to say that um, learning on um, point cloud actually is such a popular field that there are many, many more problems that we have not covered. For example, there's a problem is called the consolidation or like the super resolution of point clouds. And then given a uh, point cloud with the normals, how are we able to predict the normals that have the consistent orientation, right? And then how do we achieve like the completion of the point cloud from only a partial one? Well, we very briefly mentioned in the diffusion model part, but actually for this problem, there are also a lot of uh, ideas that are very interesting. And then we, well, skipped a very important problem, which is the part discovery. And there are a few different ideas, like use bottom-up grouping or like use a correspondence-based approach or like even to connect the, uh, you know, 3D point cloud understandings of languages. And then there are the problem of self-supervised learning. And in the past uh, recent years, like there are the work of uh, like consider uh, contrastive learning on point clouds. And in fact, we also didn't have the time to cover like transformers for point clouds, uh, which is very helpful if you add self-supervised learning to it to train. And then there are the works that will consider to deploy 
um, point cloud learning algorithms on real uh, well, machines like or hardware, and then it's important to accelerate the, the, the inference speed, like to consider quantization or to consider uh, network compression. And then there are the problem of studying the adversarial robustness of point cloud learning algorithm, and there are many more. So for the sake of a time, um, it's not possible to cover them all, okay? Well, if you're interested, I encourage that you check the literature um, from like CV, CG, machine learning, robotics, all these communities, there are lots of point cloud learning algorithms. So I'm also teaching a course at UCSD, which is a graduate level course that covers a broader set of topics in better depth. If you're interested, you can go to my homepage and find teaching and go to the ML Miss Geometry uh, course. And uh, well, all the slides are public. So if you're interested in the general direction of point cloud learning, welcome to join this stream. There are still a lot to explore. And thank you very much for listening to my presentation today.